Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for January 19th, 2018. This is Peter Serretta, and on today's podcast, we will have some reviews from the opening night of the 2018 Sundance Film Festival. And in our feature presentation, Rob Hunter will share with us the best movies of 2018 or 2017 that you probably haven't seen. I haven't seen any of these films, so there's a big chance you probably haven't seen these films either. Um, so, yeah, bef- uh, but before we get to that, I should say, uh, you know, I'm recording this back in uh, my home studio in Los Angeles. Uh, as you probably heard in the previous episodes of the podcast, uh, I slipped and fell uh, not even spectacularly. It was it was on a small three-foot hill that didn't have any snow or anything, but my hand went out to catch my fall and, you know, the 200... 80 some odd pounds of body weight all came crushing down on my wrist and um i think the last time i talked to you guys i was recording from the emergency care which luckily was just across the street uh from from this accident uh my hand was not hurting at the time but had ballooned to like a huge comical uh imagine chris pine in uh jj abrams star trek kind of (laughs) way so i I went to the urgent care and got an x-ray and uh even uh the x-ray technician who uh you know i asked her you know how's it looking uh, she, and she was like, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not qualified to give you any insight on this x-ray document. But even I can see what appears to be a huge fracture going through your wrist. So um, I, I uh, so it, it looks uh, it looks pretty bad in the x-ray. I'm going to see a uh, orthopedic surgeon today in Los Angeles and um I'm thinking, at least from what I heard of the doc- from the doctor in uh, Park City, that uh, there's very, very, very good chance that I'm going to have to go through surgery and get a plate installed into my uh, into my wrist. So uh, we'll see how that does and how that impacts the site and the podcast. Because I can tell you right now, I, I know this is probably an ob obvious observation but doing things with one hand is very hard um but it's a lot harder than you think even like you know such thing as you know going to the bathroom and pulling up your jeans and but you know uh tightening the belt with one hand you know becomes something that's like 20 times the amount of time that it usually takes you with two hands um so it, it, it's very difficult to type, very difficult to do anything. Luckily, I can talk. So uh, I'm hoping that we can continue the podcast. I can t- continue on the podcast with you guys. Um, but I, I think I've spent enough time talking about this injury. I want to thank you all, everybody on social media, people that have reached out via email, uh, you know, wishing me well, uh, you know, it, it, it means a lot uh, that you guys, uh, I, I received hundreds, if not a thousand uh, responses to this injury and um, I feel so stupid for this having happened um, but uh, I feel like I am uh, surrounded by friends so I, I thank you and uh, right now we're going to go to Ben and Brad who are still in Park City, Utah who last night recorded this bit of audio uh, talking about the opening films of the Sundance Film Festival 2018 uh, thanks for that great intro, Peter. That definitely wasn't recorded at a different time. Uh, yes, we're here at Sundance Film Festival. It's just me and Ben Pearson, uh, because as you know, Peter is home with a fractured wrist, and Chris Evangelista has the plague somewhere. Um, so we had the first day of Sundance today. Uh, kicked it off with uh, a couple movies each for us, uh, and the first one that we got to see, we were both at. Um, it was a movie called Blind Spotting which stars David Diggs, who uh, you guys might know from the very successful Broadway play Hamilton. Um, And this was a movie that I enjoyed quite a bit. Um, I dare say that I loved it simply because just how much, uh, how bold it is in putting forth the commentary that it has about racism and gentrification. Um, It's definitely uh, one of the things I, I wrote immediately on Twitter afterwards is that it feels like it's, do the right thing for the Black Lives Matter movement. It has that kind of vibrance and energy and life that Spike Lee put into Do the Right Thing. 
Um, but this one is set in Oakland and it, it perfect. I've never been to Oakland, but like, it feels like it perfectly captures what Oakland at least used to be before it started being taken over by hipster culture and that kind of thing. Yeah. And that, that gentrification is something that the movie tackles head on as well. I mean, this has a lot on its mind. It's, it's a movie with a lot to say and it, it impressively balances a ton of different things. I think it, it really walks a, a nice tightrope of, it's a hilarious movie, first of all. There's tons yeah, of humor in it. For, yeah, for the hard subject matter that it tackles, it is very funny. Yeah. Um, but it takes these sharp turns into very poignant, suspenseful, tense moments that, yeah. uh, one particular one, we won't spoil what it is, but you just, you're on the edge of your seat and you're like, oh my god, like, what's going to happen next? Yeah, there are a couple of those in this movie. And, and the basic plot of it is uh, David Diggs plays a guy who um, has served some time. He's a convicted felon mm -hmm. and he is in the, the final days of his probation period. So he's just trying to stay on the straight and narrow. And his uh, his best friend, his longtime best friend since childhood is... Um, is sort of uh, making that difficult for him. We'll yeah. put it that way. So that's the general gist of it. But yeah, I would. I think Brad and I both agree that this is definitely one that you guys should put on your radar for whenever it comes out later this year, hopefully, uh, as soon as it gets acquired or something. Um, this is definitely one that you're going to want to see. So uh, after Blind Spotting, Brad, you went off and saw a different movie. What'd you see and what'd you think about it? I did, yeah. I caught a screening of Private Life, uh, which is a movie that has already been, uh, I don't know if it was picked up by Netflix or if they're the ones that actually produced it or not. Um, but you'll see, so you'll definitely see that sometime this year, I believe. And it stars Catherine Hahn and Paul Giamatti, uh, as a couple, um, both kind of artsy folks. She's an author and he's a, a playwright or form, former theater director. And they're desperately trying to have a kid. They've gone through all these fertilization steps. They they keep trying more. They're, they're still trying to do adoption while they're trying to do fertilization. And, uh, it's just this, you know, kind of agonizing story of them trying to have a kid, and uh, I really enjoyed it. The performances are uh, fantastic. Both Catherine Hahn and Paul Giamatti are great. Um, I think the best performance in the movie is probably from uh, Kaylee Carter, uh, who is a younger actress who plays their niece. And uh, she's just, it's a breakthrough performance for her, I think. She uh, plays a, a great character, uh, very sarcastic, um, very affable and uh, charming. She was, she was absolutely great in the movie. My only complaint about it is that it feels like it drags a little bit, but at the same time, when I say that to myself, like I think on it and it almost fits in thematically with the theme of the movie because you're with this couple every step of the way and like you want them to have a kid and like them like them waiting to hear the news as to like if she is pregnant, if something's gonna work or not, the length almost kind of adds to it because you're along that ride with them. Like mm -hmm. you feel like you're in their shoes and so it, it makes it that much more agonizing for you as an audience member. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a good thing. Yeah, cool. Um, so after uh, we both left Blind Spotting, I went off and saw a documentary called Generation Wealth. And this is written and directed by Lauren Greenfield, who is the documentarian who made a movie called uh, The Queen of Versailles a few years ago. I actually haven't seen that movie, but you saw it, right? Yeah, but it's been a while, though. Yeah, I think it came out in, like, 2012 or 2013 yeah. or something like that. It's been a little bit. Um, but this uh, movie is really fascinating. I've never seen, I wasn't really familiar with Greenfield's work. She's uh, a longtime photographer. She's been in the industry for 25 years or something. And this movie works as sort of a retrospective of her whole career. There's actually footage from Queen of Versailles in there. Uh, as well as going all the way back to when she was in high school in the 80s and 90s and like taking um, photos of people like Kim Kardashian when she was 12 years old just because they all went to these, you know, the same sort of private school in L.A. This, the, huh. It's all about like this rich, uh, the culture of being rich and what that means and, and what that is doing to society and, and how it's like affecting uh, really like every aspect of our lives and, and how it's sort of permeating, um, you know, all aspects of culture. Uh, so that's like the, the large uh, scope of the movie. There's some really fascinating stuff in here. She interviews like the, one of the sons of the lead singer of Ario Speedwagon, who was like, you know, going through some crazy stuff back in the day. And she catches up with him now these are people that she's photographed over the years. There's a lot of them. This guy and then, like, um, one of the Charlie Sheen's, like, porn star girlfriends. She took a bunch of photos for her Jeez. for a magazine spread and then caught up with her now. And so it's really fascinating to see, sort of see 
uh, these two um, time periods juxtaposed yeah. through her photography and the interviews that she did with these people. Um, and it all sort of paints this like <laughs> really sort of horrific picture of America yeah. and like our obsession with greed and wealth and fame and what that does to our mental state as a, as a country. Um, so it's a really fascinating documentary. I think Amazon has this one. So that should be hopefully available for people to see relatively soon. I'm not sure about a release date yet. I don't know if that, if that information is out there, but, um, yeah, Generation Wealth, definitely check it out. It's, uh, it's pretty good. I think, um, I think it sounds like we both had a pretty successful first day. I mean, yeah. but the movie started at like 6 PM tonight, so we didn't get a chance to see too much, but, uh, the fest is just kicking off and we've got a lot more planned. So we'll hit you guys back up with uh, more coverage in the days to come. So, Peter, we'll throw it back to you. And for our feature presentation, we're going to have the best movies of 2017 that you probably haven't seen with Rob Hunter. Rob Hunter, you might know as the chief film critic and associate editor of Film School Rejects. He uh, is one of our uh, freelancers on SlashFilm.com, so you see his name uh, from time to time on the site. Rob, how's it going? It is going very, very well in this new year. How are you? Very good. And uh, I, I, you know, we we've been in overload of like best of the year stuff, mm -hmm. but um, and, and it's probably like kind of an overload because it's a lot of the same movies. You know, a lot of people are talking about the same films because you know it seems like a lot of people have the same opinions. Um, well, there's a reason they're called the best of the year. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but one of the things I love about what you do uh, for the site is you 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 see more movies than I think most people see. Uh, you know, I see a lot of movies, not not for a film critic, but for a you know average uh, moviegoer. I think probably <laughs> sees like what uh, twenty movies a year. I see like one hundred and twenty five in a year. How many movies do you think you see in a year? In twenty seventeen, according to Letterboxd, I saw I think five hundred and twelve. Holy crap. I think that's the most out of anybody I've ever talked to. Only seen. about half of those, though, were, were 2017 releases. The rest oh. of them were like old, older films that I was playing catch up on. And you also do some deep dives. Like, you, you aren't just, um, you know, s seeing like the, the big movies. And even and by big movies, I, like, you aren't even just look, looking at the stuff that is released in the U.S. You're like, seeing a lot of stuff that's released internationally and I try, yeah, I, I try to, I try to, that's why I, one of the reasons why I love film festivals is cause I, I, I do get um, the chance to see a lot of these things um, that may, maybe don't have a U.S. release date yet. Maybe never will. Uh, cause there's obviously there's just tremendous movies, you know, made all around the world. And so I, I try and see as many of them as I can. Um, and then for the, for slash from my column with you guys, uh, it's older films, but I again, try and look for the, you know, the good to great movies that, you know, never made the best of lists, never, never won the Oscars, ne never really, you know, got a proper DVD or Blu-ray release maybe. And they're just kind of like kind of sitting there in people's memories. Um, not very many people's memories though. So, uh, yeah, I, I try and look, look at the kind of things that maybe aren't always the focus of conversation. Yeah. And uh, th this list that was published on slash film, uh, in the first week of January, uh, the best movies of 2007, you probably haven't seen do list six movies and we're going to talk about them now. And I am happy to tell you, I have not seen any of these six movies. Like that's, <laughs> that's how good of a job you did. Um, success <laughs> no because I, I i do think a lot of people do publish like the movies you haven't seen list and it's usually movies i have seen i think it's like they're speaking to you know the general public guy that sees like 20 movies a year I, th yeah. I think, yeah, I think those lists are similar. Uh, just is my opinion, but I think those lists are similar to the ones that come out saying like the worst movies of the, of the year because they're always movies that they're they're not really fitting the description <laughs> that you're giving in the title. Um, in the worst movies case, they're ones that played in theaters, and in the worst movie of the year will never be a movie that played in a theater <laughs> with a recognizable actor or actress. Um, and the same thing with these. I mean, yeah, th these I try and pick ones that aren't even the underrated. You know, they're not even the ones that are like critically acclaimed you know, but not making a lot of box office. These ones just really aren't among the conversation, with the exception of one that has recently picked up in the conversation of these six. So that's good to see. For sure. Uh, let's start off with your first pick, and that is Among the Living. 
So th- this one is actually, uh, as, as if you read the column, you know I, I occasionally will, will, will cheat on my own rules. And this one actually came out in 2014, I think. Um, it's a French movie, though, and it didn't actually get a release in the U.S. until 2017. And, and that's why I, I think it counts. And it's my column, so that's, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's from the guys who made Inside, the French thriller about the pregnant woman who is then stalked uh, by a kind of like a mad lady who is – after what's inside the pregnant woman, um, it's a it, which is a it's it's a you know kind of kind of silly and kind of dumb movie that one inside, but it's just brutal and just grabs your attention. This one here, um, like I said, came out in 2014 over in France and elsewhere in the world and hit some festival circuits as well. It's a really interesting mix of like uh, Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment Amblin Films um, with like a, a hard R uh, horror. Uh, you know, approach because it's about these three friends, you know, three young kids, like maybe 13, 14 years old, you know, they're ditching school. They're just kind of, you know, they're playful you know, they're just, you know, typical average American boys, only they're French. Um, <laughs> and, uh, on one of their days ditching school, they're out and about and they go to this, um, you know, abandoned, uh, film studio out in the like, rural France, which itself is also a very cool setting. But while they're there, they witness uh, a car pulls up, um, a weird guy gets out and you know leaves the scene and they go over to like explore the car and they find a woman bound and gagged in the trunk. And before they can get her out of there, the guy comes back and it becomes this whole, you know, thing of like them trying to rescue the woman, you know, without this, this, you know, really freaky guy getting a hold of them. Um, it doesn't quite go according to plan. And then it just even moves on from there. Uh, basically their, their, their problems follow them home. And it's it's surprising at times because it's it doesn't go the route you think it's going to go, um, and like I said, when it makes this shift from you know just kind of like you know preteen or teenage hijinks to you know vicious <laughs> serial killer shenanigans, um, it just it takes that turn and it just rolls with it um, onwards through the end, and it's 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 really well done. It's it's an attractive film too. I mean, a lot of it is and some of it is like at night and in tunnels. But a lot of it is daytime shots of rural France. It's just you know gorgeous landscapes, and you you get this sense of of youth and the sense of playfulness and you know hijinks that again take this just horrible horrible turn. Okay, I think you've sold me on this film. Where can, where <laughs> where can I see it? It's currently playing on Shutter. So if you have uh, access to a subscription to Shutter, or I, I I do it through Amazon, but you can also just do a you know, straight up subscription directly to shutter um and i'm sure there are also import dvds or blu rays you can get too but the quickest way to get it would be through shutter okay let's go on to your next the next film on your list which is boca is that how you pronounce yeah. it yeah um I, I pronounce it boca i've never heard it spoken because i don't think it's spoken in the film really um they reference what it, what it means but it's not actually spoken in the film the there's a lot of dislike for this movie well i say a lot not a lot of people saw it but the people that did see it i didn't see a lot of positive replies but i actually just loved it to me it, it it's it's this couple who go to iceland the young couple goes to iceland and it includes a, a make Mon- michael monroe from it follows um and matt o'leary they go to iceland for a trip you know and it's it's meant to be like this little getaway but they wake up in their little uh hotel room and they you know get up and walk downstairs and the entire town the entire city is empty, devoid of people. There's nobody. There's nothing, you know, they can't reach anybody on the phones. There's no, you know, visit. They can't find anybody. There's no bodies. Just everybody has just disappeared. Um, it's like a Mary Celeste situation, like a Roanoke kind of thing. Um, and so they it sounds almost like a twilight zone kind of. Exactly. It, it takes, that's what I was going to say. It's like a feature length twilight zone, but it, it gets into some really interesting, um, both metaphysical, but also, you know, spiritual issues, uh, questions that the two of them raise because they're, the movie kind of sees – you have like the shock element, like, okay, what's going on here? Um, the inquisitive part where they try and figure it out. Then they kind of accept it and say, okay, well, this is – you know, this is what it is, but they don't know what it is. I mean, is it like a, is it like heaven? Is it purgatory? Uh, are there aliens? Is there a virus? You know, did they miss something? Is it a dream? They just don't know. And so they try and, um, you know, make the most of it, but the two of them have completely differing uh, approaches and senses and understandings of, of what this means. And so it, the, the story kind of goes again to me, some very interesting places as these two, you know, People, I mean, they're they're in love. They're a young couple, but they have this distinct uh, dividing line in how they approach what situ- you know the situation that's been handed to them. And uh, it's, it, it, it's, it, to me, it's fascinating. I was going to say, no spoilers, but is the answer uh, satisfying? Um, for for me, I, I hesitate to call it an answer, but for me, the conclusion is highly satisfying. Um, 
But it's one of those films where I wouldn't fault somebody for not finding it satisfying. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those. But, but for me, it works like Gangbusters because it pulls you into these characters. They Both both actors do a great job. Um, it pulls you into both you know their individual situations, but their collective you know situation. Um, and where the story goes, you just – you're enthralled, at least I'm enthralled by it and fascinated and you understand both of their perspectives and you know that they're, they're competing. They don't, they're not really going to work together and, and they're in cousins, you know, additional problems. I mean, I kind of love these kind of mystery box uh, setups for, for stories. Uh, where can we buy or view Broca? This one is available to rent or you can also buy the DVD on Amazon. I don't think it's available like a regular streaming yet. Ah. And the next film on your list is Boys in the Trees. Great name for a movie. It is. It is. And this one is a. It's an odd one. I, I kind of put it. I put it on my um, horror list, best best horror of the year, over at uh, Film School Rejects. But it is a borderline horror movie. It's it's really. It's an Australian film. It's a kind of a odd little coming of age thing. But it's about a two kids who, you know, previously, like in, in maybe the few years past, were kind of best friends, whatever. But they they kind of split. Because one, you know, grew a little bit taller, got a little bit cooler, and the other one, you know, didn't and didn't kind of graduate, you know, to, to those uh, same social circles. And so it's it's kind of it's, Hall- it's Halloween night. And so even though it's Australia, it, it feels very much like a, you know, like a Halloween in America and suburban America. You got, the you know, the leaves rolling, blowing in, in the streets. You got the decorations. You got the kids running around like up in their makeup and costumes. Um, and the movie is just takes place over that night, over Halloween night. As these two, you know, ex friends, kind of reconnect, and uh, there's a lot of dialogue as, as they kind of like walk around the town, kind of revisiting um, experiences from their past and their friendship. But it's there's a is, just a, is this kind of like the before series? The the oh no 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 this this no. one is uh you, the movies the trilogy. Yeah, like it sounds like you, you're saying it takes place over all one night with them walking around having it, conversations. It is, it is that, yeah, but but the, but they don't end up falling in love. Well, yeah, I, I wasn't <laughs> saying I wasn't suggesting they're, that. they're children, um, but the uh, it, it's but it is yeah, it's all one night. And so it's so, it's, so like, it's the Amblin version of the before. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So it's it's them exploring, like I said, just like the the connections they had in the past, but also where they differed. Um, and, and why they actually, you know, ended up getting pulled apart. But there's a, a real darkness that is sitting, you know, just kind of below the surface through much of it. You see a lot of it, like, on the superficial level, in again, in the imagery of Halloween. But th- there's a tone there that is kind of building throughout it. Um, and it, it builds to, like, a, I think, a, a good solid end. It's maybe not entirely surprising. I mean, if you're paying attention to the movie, you can kind of see where things are going. Um, but I, I think it's very, very effective. Where can we find this film? This one is currently streaming on Netflix. Very cool. Um, okay, let's go to the next film on your list, and that is Heart Blackened. This is a South Korean movie, um, and I'm a huge, huge fan of, of South Korean cinema um, and uh, all, all different kinds. But specifically, I'm a big fan of like the thrillers and action genre. Um, this one is kind of a, a courtroom slash, you know, thriller legal thriller uh but it stars Choi min sik from old boy and he's a you know powerful ceo of this company he's got a uh, a teenage daughter who's kind of a brat he's got a a new uh, fiance a young you know attractive fiance who's like a pop star the woman and the child don't really get along well and one night the woman ends up dead and all signs point to the teenage girl killed her you know, most likely out of some kind of like, you know, spiteful rage or jealous rage, something. And so the father is stuck. Okay, well, one, he's lost the woman he loves. Two, it's his daughter who's being accused of it and is now on trial. And so he puts basically everything he's got into um, not only trying to like, you know, defend her, you know, when it comes to the court, but also to, you know, find out what's going on. And so the movie kind of follows this story along. It's an interesting um, structure, though, because it's like a three-act movie that, ends where you think a movie would normally end then there's a weird and i love it but there's a fourth act <laughs> that kind of shows up on there um that explores things a lot in more a lot more detail um to offer up you know kind of a, a clearer picture of what happened you know provide a lot more you know more answers um and just again highly satisfying and toy Min sick is, is amazing as always um and just it's, it's got a really good sense to it it's again a legal thriller so there's a lot of like courtroom shenanigans but it's uh, got suspense. It's got you know, a few action beats as different characters, you know, kind of come and go. And 
the connection between him and his daughter, even though, again, she's a, a horrible brat, <laughs> you, you, the sense of love between them, I think, comes across really well, especially as it grows, um, you know, as, as the film progresses. It just does a really good job. Okay, of course I want to see this film. Give me the bad news. <laughs> Not currently available. It opened in, um, I mean, it should be, uh, I say should, it, it should be showing up at some point. I think it had like a limited release. Um, which means that it should end up getting like you know some kind of either like a DVD or, or it'll just like randomly show up on Amazon Prime or something, and I'll let you know as soon as that happens. Okay, let's talk about your next film, Mr. Roosevelt. So this is like a um, I saw this one for the first time at the uh, Dallas Internet or Dallas Film Festival. I don't know somewhere in Texas I saw it. How many and, film um, festivals do you go to each year? Uh, uh, three. I'm not many. Three or four. Oh, okay. The only the only, st- the only ones that are locked in are Sundance and Fantastic Fest. Other than that, I'll, I mix it up and I do a couple. Oh, I do um, Fantasia as well. So that's three locked ones per year, and then I kind of maybe throw in one or two more whenever I can make it happen. Yeah. So, um, go ahead. So you saw this in Dallas? Yeah, at the Film Fest, and it's a it's it's by all accounts it's kind of like a uh, a traditional you know indie. Uh, comedy, you know, I guess it's got a character who who goes home for whatever reason, and there they discover, you know, who's in her twenties, and she discovers things about herself, and you know, blah blah blah. I, I remember so, either last year or the year before at Sundance, like like ten of the films yeah, had that yeah. plot synopsis. <laughs> like there was a like like a dead or ill family member yep. forcing yep. them to go home and find themselves and encounter. Yep. Yeah. And that's the same thing here, but it's a dead, it's a dying or ill uh, pet. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, and also it's a, it's a female lead character. I, I tend to find these films are like male driven for some reason. Yeah. Um, the majority of them seem to be, and maybe it's because like, Oh, well the man's got to you know, go from a boy to a man. I don't know what it is, but in this case it's, it's a woman and it's, um, Noelle Wells who was, uh, in the first season of master of none. She was the female lead. Okay. Um, and she actually wrote and directed this movie as well, as well as takes the leading role here. And it just is, again, it's, even though it has that very um, familiar structure to it, that again, if you've seen any of the indie movies, you, you know this, it takes that structure and it, it just kind of like makes it, it makes it its own. It's, it's very funny. Um, she's appealing and uh, entertaining, but she's also very human. I mean, it's not a matter of like, oh, well, there's not like any kind of grand mystery about her life. She's, you know, getting solved in this trip. She's not rediscovering or reconnecting with like necessarily with like a family member. Um, it's more about her figuring out herself uh, through her friends, through her like other relationships and interactions with people. And it just is a, um, again, it's, I just hate to call it sweet because it has kind of like a sass to it. But it just, it feels, it's a very warm movie that also is the kind of thing where you kind of like watch and you kind of nod along with it. You know, you laugh and uh, you just appreciate where she's taking it and where she's going with it. And um, I, I just think it's really well done. Again, even within the framework of the very obvious, uh, you know, indie going home to find yourself structure. Uh, I definitely want to see this. And I, I was looking up, uh, this won the Grand Jury Prize. Yep. Uh, in the Texas co- Texas competition at the Dallas International Film Festival, as well you know who's as on that jury? Well, you, me. <laughs> so, you, so you're saying you're responsible for this? I am, and I actually got to I got to hand her her award um, because you know the movie earned it. So well, that yeah. is very cool, and yeah. it also won the Audience Award in the Narrative Spotlight at the South by Film Festival. Yep. yep. So very cool. Um, where can people see this film? This one, I believe, is on – it's rentable on Amazon Video. I'm not sure if it's streaming yet. Um, might be by now, but it's definitely rentable on Amazon Video. Okay, let's talk about your final film, and that is Super Dark Times. So this one is of, – of the six, this is the one that has built up um, happily the the most recognition online. I think I've, I'm seeing more people talk about it. Uh, it's one I had heard about, and I wasn't necessarily convinced on it. For some reason, it just kind of – the image of it came across – there's some sirens going here, so bear with me. <laughs> um, it, it came across as kind of like maybe a little too mopey is what, is what I first thought, like basically on what people were saying about it and just like a trailer or something like that. But what it is, it's actually a super engrossing, and for anyone who was ever a uh, a teenage boy who you know went through puberty, you know had anxiety, worried about um, you know not fitting in, um, but then also at the same time had your own cluster of friends that as far as you were concerned was all you needed at the time. It hits those beats so beautifully. Um, 
But, but by, what by the way, isn't that the story for everybody? Like, I feel like it, it, it is. It is. It is. When, when, when I was in high school, I thought that like people were popular and stuff like that. But everybody I encounter in life had the same story as me, which is basically kind of that where you had this close group of friends and thought you were yep. popular. Yep. And that to me is like one of my favorite things. And even now as an adult, when I hear people talk about like, you know, oh, well, so-and-so at, at work, you know, has it so easy, whatever. It is one of those things where it's like, you know what, you've got, you, you really have no idea what the other person's experience is or perception is. Um, and most likely you're all going home <laughs> and saying the same thing about everybody else. It just, it just is the way it is. You've got your situation and it's, it's usually going to be very, very similar to everybody else's. Um, but the movie captures a specific, I think, age group, number one, super well. And then it also captures I, – I, I was a teenage boy, so I, I can, I'll speak for myself. I won't point this finger at anybody else. But, but there's a darkness, um, I think, in growing up, in you know, finding yourself attracted to people but not necessarily getting that you know, returned, um, thinking other people, are, again, are, are better off or stronger or more popular or better looking or more successful than you are. And as you're dealing with all that and your hormones are raging, it's a very specific time, I think. And the movie captures it so, so well while also recognizing that these are still – Again, this cusp of childhood to you know almost adulthood, because they're kids who are like playing around. Like the, basically, the inciting incident here is there's a, a, there's a couple of friends, best friends, and um, there's a couple others that kind of come along and play with them one day. And uh, one has like a, this fancy sword, it's like a samurai sword that is, I think his stepdad or dad you know brought home from wherever. And so they're playing with it, and so that's kind of like a very childish thing because I mean it's just one sword. You're just kind of out there in the field playing with it, swinging it around. Um, but uh, as <laughs> often happens when you're playing with sharp objects, um, w- w- whenever hard- there is a kid in a movie that's playing with a sword <laughs> or a gun, you yep. know what's going to happen. You, you know where it's going. And so it goes there in, in a horrific fashion. And so it then becomes an issue of, OK, what do these kids do about this? How, how do they handle this? And of course, they handle it poorly. That's I mean, otherwise you wouldn't have a movie. So they handle it poorly. But where it goes from there is. It, it, it starts testing friendships. Um, you can have, even though this, this this darkness is sitting there, you have these threads coming in of like at the same time, these are like, you know, like teenage boys who find themselves liking the same girl. And so there's, there's this competition, there's jealousy, there's you know, issues of their friendship that are kind of colliding with the fact that this, um, you know, horrible act is sitting in their recent uh, history together. And it, it builds, I think, to a third act that is just... You don't find a lot of movies, I don't think. Even, even I mean, movies that are filled with violence and action <clears throat> or suspense. You don't find a lot of them that actually take tension and apply it like masterfully to what you're seeing and experience. I think Green Room is a great example, a recent example of a movie that just layers on tension from beginning to end, almost. This one is in this third act here, and it just you, you're so engrossed in these characters and what they've been going through and the decisions they've been making. That it builds to this this third act that I think just twists things, you know, twists in your gut just really, really well. Um, you're cringing. I mean, you're kind of clenching your fist you, you're, as you're watching this unfold, and you really don't know what the next beat is going to be. Um, and it just is, it, but it, it doesn't. It's not supernatural. It's not like you know beyond the bounds of reality. Um, it's very, again, very human. But it's uh, it just it, it really just hits you in the gut. I don't know how else to say it. Um, well, at the same time, it just remains familiar. I mean, you feel like you could be – well, I'll speak for myself. I feel like <laughs> I could have been <laughs> one of these kids. Yeah. Um, I, I, and lo- so I love how you call it a, a, a deeply a, – a deceptively affecting drama that suggests John Hughes on a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. <laughs> and I stand by that. It's, it's, it very much is that. It's, it's again, something we all – a time and a place we all remember – but with just a slight tweak, um, you know, that anyone who experienced it would want to forget. So this sounds like another film I want to see. Where can I see it? Um, it is available on Amazon, but I believe it just recently uh, showed up on Netflix streaming. So you can, you can definitely check it out on Netflix. I was about to say, you work for Amazon, don't you? <laughs> because, <laughs> because you've just made me spend so much money on Amazon <laughs> video. Uh, so uh, this is a great list. Uh, what list are you working on next for the site? Um, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm still touching up my own, uh, when I did a couple of the writers, a, a Christmas horror list, I keep adding new ones to it. <laughs> so I have that going on. Um, 
I have uh, my regular weeklies. I do like a monthly look also at like Netflix and Hulu and uh, Amazon Video um, to try and keep on top of what's showing up on those on those streaming services. Um, other than that, I'm just hitting like the regular weekly releases and getting ready for a Sundance in two weeks. Oh, yeah, that's going to be fun. Uh, we, we are going to Sundance. Uh, this might even air at Sundance. So I don't I, I don't know when we're, we're recording this in the, the beginning of January because we're prepping for Sundance. Uh, but uh, OK, so, Rob. Where can people find more of your work online? Uh, Film School Rejects is where the majority of my writing is. Um, I'm the main critic over there, but I also do individual columns, home video coverage, um, stuff like that. Highlight things whenever I can. Uh, here at Slash Film, I've got a bi-weekly column, and then I show up randomly other times as well. Um, I occasionally show up over at Crooked Marquee, um, and then on Twitter at Fake Rob Hunter. I love that, t- uh, that uh, Twitter name. It's great. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Rob. Thank you.